Koala in the name of our Savior Jesus. My name is Mark Reichertz. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, I look forward to meeting you soon. I was installed as pastor here last Sunday. I'm very privileged to be here with you, excited about uh, moving forward here in ministry with you. It's a special day that we are celebrating here today. It's the day that's called Transfiguration. That's just a big word that means that Jesus changed appearances. When he was up on the mountain of transfiguration, shortly before he was arrested and crucified, he changed appearances to show his glory that he'd been hiding uh, ever since he came into this world. You remember he was born as a baby in Bethlehem, placed in a manger in a stable, lowly. He lived in a lowly way. There was nothing special about the way he looked or lots of the things that he did. But on this day, he gave us just a glimpse of who he really is and what he really came here to do and what he really came here to bring us to as well. He showed his heavenly glory so that we would know that he came here to take us to heavenly glory with him. That's what we celebrate here on the day of the transfiguration of our Lord. Hopefully you picked up a service folder on your way and it tells you that our opening hymn for today is number 712, Jesus Take Us to the Mountains. You can find that in your blue hymnal somewhere. God bless your worship.
Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him, deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me, according to your ever unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin, and take away my guilt. God, the Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. We remember that he also appeared to his people in a thick cloud, but one that amazed them because he revealed himself to us as our Holy Savior, the one who forgives our sins and brings us to be with him in heaven forever. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction." When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. This is the word of our Lord. Let's continue now with our psalm of the day. It's Psalm 148. You can find it on page 121 in the front part of your hymnals. Let's sing the psalm again. <laughs>
New Testament book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Here Peter reminds us that the scriptures are not just fairy tales. Everything they tell us is real history that the Holy Spirit makes sure to record for us in order to comfort our souls and in order to give us confidence that Jesus really is the Son of God and our Savior and in order for us to know that whatever happens to us and whatever he does for us, our God does everything in order to bring us home to heaven to be with him one day. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of our Lord. Let's continue now with our Sunday school song. So Sunday school kids, come on forward.
remarks of our Lord, please stand for the gospel lesson. Today's gospel comes from Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the Gospel of our Lord.
and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen, dear brothers and sisters. Jesus must have thought sometimes that speaking to his disciples was like speaking to a wall. And what he said usually didn't seem to stick or it just went right over their heads. Six days before Jesus' transfiguration on a high mountain, was another mountaintop event, so to speak. Peter and the other disciples boldly confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus told them, you're absolutely right, and here's what that means. He told them that being the Christ meant suffering and dying for the sins of the world. But then Peter stopped. Nothing Jesus had said to him, nothing Peter had seen from him, had stuck, had sunk in. Peter objected. No, that can't be right. He had his own ideas about the Christ wrong as they were, and he didn't want to hear anything else. Jesus couldn't die. That just didn't make sense. He was supposed to be this great and glorious king who would restore the fortunes of Israel. But Peter wasn't really listening to what Jesus was saying. Jesus had to go to the cross because that was the only way for him to take away the sins of the world. That was, the, was what the Christ really came here to do. But if Peter had been listening to Jesus, he would have known that this story would not end in Jesus' death. And so that's why six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a high mountain in order to witness his transfiguration. It was all about assurance. And the message that Jesus had for them on that mountaintop is the same that he has now for us who have those same struggles. No matter how bleak it looks or how much you might question it sometimes, victory is coming. Don't just hear Jesus' words and not take them to heart. Listen when God speaks about his plan and about his person and about his purpose because what he's telling you changes everything. So Jesus brought his inner circle of disciples up the mountain with him that day so that they could be alone. He had something to show them that wasn't ready just yet for public consumption, but they needed to see it before they saw Jesus beaten and bloody and hanging on a cross. There Jesus was transfigured before them where in, in light as, as bright white as a flash of lightning and dazzling splendor. He revealed his glory as true God that he'd been hiding under his human flesh ever since he came into this world. And then if as if that sight weren't enough to behold. All of a sudden, the ancient prophets Moses and Elijah appeared right there along with him and began to speak with him about what was about to happen to him. I mean, just imagine that scene. These were maybe the two most towering prophetic figures in the whole Old Testament. These were legends that the disciples had been learning about since their childhood. And there, as they listened in, they found out that they all shared the same faith in the same <laughs> Messiah. Jesus was the object of their faith and that of every believer all throughout the Old Testament. What Moses and Elijah believed and taught in their time was in total agreement with everything that those disciples saw unfolding before their very eyes. It was God's plan all along that Jesus should come into this world and die for the sins of all people. And what he was about to do was the culmination of all the hopes of his people. Moses and Elijah and everyone else since the beginning of time. These disciples were there to witness this for a reason. It was so that they could listen and believe. All along, scriptures had pointed to Jesus. The disciples were not left without witnesses. 
from the beginning of time. God used men like Moses and Elijah to bring his gospel message to this world just like he does now through the teaching of the disciples. And friends, that means that God has not left us without witnesses either. We have the same scriptures that testify to Jesus from the first page to the last. We have that same eyewitness testimony of God's glory in Jesus. And so that means that we too can have that same total assurance that everything that happened to Jesus was a part of God's plan. He was in total control the whole time, even when he was suffering and dying for us. This was God's plan all along to make sure that we have a place at home in heaven with him someday. So friends, let's do like the disciples were supposed to. Let's listen when God speaks. Yes, it was certainly good for the disciples to be there. I mean, who among sinful humanity was ever so blessed to see and hear something like that? They were so overwhelmed, they were so excited, and at the same time so frightened that they didn't even know what to say. So Peter, like he normally did, just blurted out the first thing that came to his mind. Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. They didn't want this moment to end. To them, this was like heaven on earth. But then that cloud that came and enveloped them signaled that it must. The disciples still just didn't get it. Even when they heard Jesus speaking with the prophets, they didn't really listen. And that's the same old Peter again, isn't it? Six days before, remember, he had tried to talk Jesus out of going to the cross. And, and here again, innocently enough, he does the same. He still just didn't understand that this was going to happen, that it had to happen. They couldn't all stay there on that mountain with Jesus, as wonderful and appealing as that sounds, because in a sinful world, there is no such thing as heaven on earth. As heaven on earth. They had to leave that mountain because Jesus had a job to do. And it was winning our salvation so that one day they could go to be with him in heaven. They had to leave that mountain and go to Mount Calvary. Jesus had to lay down his glory one more time and humble himself to death. And when God the Father spoke from that cloud, he left no doubt that Jesus was just the person to do this job. Jesus left his throne in heaven to take on human flesh so that he could be everything he needed to be in order to save us from our sins. He is the one who speaks God's own word to us and does God's own will for us. When God the Father rang out, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. That was his ultimate seal of approval on Jesus as his Son and our Savior. Friends, when God speaks to us about the person of Jesus, about who he really is, we should listen. I mean, we hear every week in church that Jesus didn't just come here to make things better for us in this life. He had a, a so much greater purpose for us than simply turning this world into a utopia. And we see that all the time, actually, whenever we look around us and things are getting worse instead of better. But, you know, we can be just as slow as the disciples to learn that, can't we, sometimes? When things start to go south for us physically and spiritually, how quick are we to blame God or to accuse Him of doing us wrong? Do we think that our Lord won't really do anything about our problems, or that he even can do anything about our problems? Why can't we see how we blind ourselves to the glory that he revealed just for us at times like these? I mean, listen to the Father speak about Jesus, about 
who he really is and what he really came here to do and what that really means for us now. See how much your God loves you, that he was even willing to humble himself, to suffer and die so that you can live with him forever. He walked the path of the cross because he loves you that much. He gave up everything so that you could have everything, so that he could be your Savior. And now, as we walk that same path of suffering in this sinful world, well, that means we can have that same confidence as the disciples. Jesus is true, almighty God. He proved it there on the hill. And so that means we shouldn't ever think that he doesn't have the power or the care to help us out of our problems and our sufferings, because he most certainly does. But he also has the love and the wisdom to know what's truly best for us and for our relationship with him. And so maybe if that means he doesn't fix all of our problems right now, then he surely will give us the strength to live under our crosses and stay close to him until he finally brings us home to himself and makes everything right for us again then. You know, sometimes we might not get the way our God works in our lives, and actually that's okay, because even better, we know the heart of our Savior. And we know that we will understand one day, even if we don't right now, we will understand one day when we see him in his unveiled glory in heaven. You know, when that cloud appeared and that voice rang out, it all just became too much. Those disciples fell flat on their faces, completely terrified, completely overloaded. But then just as suddenly, there was a calm. The familiar voice and familiar face of Jesus comforted them. But you have to think maybe with, with a smile and a wink. I mean, could the disciples ever look at Jesus the same way again, knowing what kind of glory was hidden there in his flesh? Jesus' transfiguration was meant to be a great comfort and assurance to them so that they would know that their constant companion and most beloved friend was in fact glorious God, even and especially when he was being tortured and killed. They had to know that their discipleship wasn't meaningless and that Jesus wasn't powerless, but that he had a purpose in everything that he was about to go through. But yet, those disciples still just couldn't understand that whole big picture. And so that's why Jesus told them as they were on their way down the mountain, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Well, now what exactly was that supposed to be? Well, even though they might not have gotten anything really that happened on that mountain, even though they didn't really get much of what happened before then, even though they really wouldn't get much of what was about to happen to Jesus either, if there was one clear thing that Jesus wanted them to take away from all this, it was that what was about to happen to him would not mark him as some would-be leader of men reject. It would mark him as their victorious savior and king. That one clear thing, that one sure promise Jesus made that was backed up by the rock-solid testimony of the prophets and the Father himself was that Jesus was not going to stay dead. Yes, he would suffer and die like the worst of criminals, but listen when God speaks. There is a resurrection coming. That was his purpose. And friends, that's the message of good news. That's a gospel promise that Jesus still speaks to us today as well. You know, we've all had our spiritual mountaintop experiences when God's power and glory are unmistakable in our lives. Times when, when we can see so clearly God's hand working to bless us or 
or when God uses us to bring his word to somebody who really needs it. We've all had those experiences. But as long as we live here in this sinful world, we never stay on that mountaintop. We always have our valleys, too. Life is going to fall apart. People are going to reject or ignore or mock what we say and believe. Sin's going to rear its ugly head in any number of different ways. We may never stay on that mountaintop, but we always remember it, we always cherish it, and we always cling to its promises for dear life. See, Jesus' transfiguration was meant to prepare the disciples for what was coming, for Jesus' arrest and for everything that would follow. And truthfully, that's why we celebrate this festival now too, because it prepares us for the solemn days of Lent. But it also prepares us for life, because we have our crosses to bear too. The Transfiguration teaches us that our worship and our life and our whole relationship with God, it's not about the up and down feelings of our hearts. It's about the rock-solid truth of our God's promises to us. And so, friends, even when your life looks like it's crashing down around you, remember who your Savior is and what he's done for you and the power that he promises to employ for your good. Take to heart how much he loves you and the heaven that awaits you when you will see him in glory. Everything that happens to us in this sinful world is meant to make us look forward to that that much more. Yes, Jesus suffered and died, but he rose victorious. The transfiguration assures us that he would and assures us that no matter what might happen to us now, even if we have to suffer and die like Jesus and the disciples did, our resurrection to eternal life is coming one day. But it would be about six months yet before the disciples would really get that. In fact, things would even get worse for them as Jesus approached his death and resurrection. The disciples would continue to stumble and even fall. But then Jesus rose. That changed everything. And the disciples never forgot. Over 35 years later, when the Apostle Peter was facing his own death for the name of Jesus Christ. He found strength in what he saw there on that mountain as he wrote the words that we had in our second lesson for today. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We ourselves heard the voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. And still now, that message the disciples needed to hear is the message that they left to echo for you. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and our Savior, no matter how it might look sometimes. And he will not be denied his victory, or your salvation. So friends, listen when God speaks. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's join together now to confess our common Christian faith with the Apostles' Creed. You can find that printed in the service form. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue now by bringing our thank offerings to our Lord. I ask if there are any visitors among us, please grab one of those connect cards that are in your pew, fill it out, and drop it in the plate as it comes by. Thank you. with our responsive prayer of the church that you can find printed in the church. We praise you, O oh Father, for the precious gift of your Son and for his glorious transfiguration on the holy mountain. Give us the firm resolve to listen to your Son, the eager readiness to believe his promises, and the joyful willingness to heed his commands. By the sign of Moses and Elijah, show us that blessed are the dead who die in faith. For they shall know the power of Christ's resurrection, and shall be changed from glory into glory. O God and Father, let your Holy Spirit find a dwelling in our poor bodies and transform our weak, sinful lives into the radiance of goodness, purity, and righteousness. Transform our minds, our understanding, our judgments and our whole persons to reflect the mind of Christ. Take our sickness and pain, our disappointments and despair, our sorrows and mourning, our pride and anger, our selfishness and envy, our hate and fear. Take all these, O oh Father, and transform them by the healing touch of Jesus into noble impulses, pure motives, kind thoughts, constructive deeds, high courage, and true faith. And finally, Heavenly Father, as we approach the church season of Lent and once again begin our solemn journey to our Savior's cross to see the price he had to pay because of our sins, give us a spirit of humble repentance and quiet confidence that looks forward to Jesus' Easter victory over sin, death, and the devil with hopeful anticipation. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Look on your church, O Lord, here and in every place, and grant that we and all who bear the name of Christ may daily offer up to you the acceptable sacrifices of repentance, thanksgiving, and loving obedience. Hear our prayer, and by your mercy, grant our petitions for Christ's sake. Amen. And we join in the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue with our next hymn. It's hymn number 96, a wondrous type of it. us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for the closing hymn. It's hymn number 95, Our Good Lord Jesus. 